Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. I'm going to make sure that you can hear me and you can see me. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Um. <clears throat> Okay, Dari and Angelica are both saying hello. I see Nick Davila waving. Dari says, we hear and see you. Thank God. Okay, um, excellent, excellent, excellent. Let's take a peruse through the chat, see who's here. Hello, Dari. Hello, Christina, darling. Angelica. Angelica Bolschweiler, Melissa Catano, hi. Kelsey Blaine Gibson, I hope you are recovering all right. Waving back at Nick Davila. Cheers, man. My mom is here. Hi, mom. Christy Davila. Amanda Benjamin. Um, yeah, I, yeah, Amanda's chiming in. I wouldn't know anything about last-minute tech issues. You can just smell the sarcasm dripping from her keyboard. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I did, I did, Amanda. As a matter of fact, I had, uh, I restarted the entire system twice, and uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Christina is also correct, so, uh, if you didn't notice, there is a new microphone in front of me. I hope it sounds awesome. Hello, Anna Ginovola! Ruth Sanchez, hi. Hey, Jojo. Okay, Kelsey Blaine Gibson is doing okay. All right. <clears throat> well, good to know you're doing at least okay. Good. Um, yeah, nice. Ni thank you. Nice new microphone. Um, I was recording and experimenting with it last night, and uh, I'm extremely happy with it. This is a Neumann, uh, so this is my, my second uh, the second Neumann I have owned, this is a Neumann U87 AI. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I, I mean, pretty top of the line. It doesn't get much topper of the line uh, than this mic uh, without going into, like, decades-old vintage... Um, we're getting up into the like astoundingly high like ten thirty thousand dollar range for microphones microphones that uh, uh, I have neither headphones nor speakers to even hear uh, the improvement beyond this guy so um, yeah I'm I'm really happy with uh, what I have experimented with with it so far <clears throat> So, let us embark upon a poetry journey as I prepare my tea. Let's see. So, Wallace Stevens. Oh, we thought this would be a, a an excellent night for Wallace Stevens. Uh, Wallace Stevens was born in 1879 and died in 1955. 
though he didn't receive widespread recognition until later in life, uh, much like Bill Withers and Morgan Freeman. Uh, Wallace Stevens is now considered one of the major American poets of the century. His genius and mastery is in his imagination, whimsy, and relation to both the English Romantics and the French Symbolists. Wallace Stevens had wanted to devote his life to literature, but his father, who was a lover of literature, counseled him to stop writing and study the law. Stevens, a uh, yeah, very practical fellow. Uh, Stevens attended Harvard, but later attended the New York School of Law from 1901 to 1904. By 1913, Stevens was enjoying great success in the field of insurance law. Unlike many aspiring artists, he was hardly stifled by steady employment. When he started writing poetry again, he confided in a letter to his wife that writing was absurd as well as fulfilling. Stevens was a provocative thinker. He vigorously explored the notion of poetry as the supreme fusion of the creative imagination and objective reality. In 19, 1923, we saw the uh, first book of poetry um, by Wallace Stevens, and the only one presently in the public domain. Um, this book of poetry was called Harmonium. Most of Harmonium's poems were published between 1914 and 1923 in various magazines and then published as a collection in 1923. Harmonium exemplifies Stevens' extraordinary vocabulary, his sense of imagery, and his ability to both lampoon and philosophize. So, all of this evening's poems are from the book Harmonium. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on with, or what was going on, Amanda. That's, that's actually what, what stressed me out this evening was when you have those like, uh, when you have those tech problems that you just have once and then you can't account for and you can't recreate it, it wasn't even just getting my levels dialed in. The uh, levels on this thing were really easy to dial in. It was something else. I know not what. But after the second restart, we're off and cracking. Um, All right. This poem, this poem is the first poem in Wallace Stevens' first book of poetry, Harmonium. This poem is called Earthly Anecdotes. Every time the bucks went clattering over Oklahoma, a fire cat bristled in the way. Wherever they went, they went clattering until they swerved in a swift circular line to the right because of the fire cat. Or until they swerved in a swift circular line to the left because of the fire cat. The bucks clattered, the fire cat went leaping to the right, to the left, and bristled in the way. Later, the fire cat closed his bright eyes and slept. <clears throat> hmm. So, the second poem is called Disillusionment of Ten O'Clock. 
by Wallace Stevens. The houses are haunted by white nightgowns. None are green or purple with green rings or green with yellow rings or yellow with blue rings. None of them are strange with socks of lace and beaded cinchers. People are not going to dream of baboons and periwinkles. Only here and there, an old sailor, drunk and asleep in his boots, catches tigers in red weather. All right, here's one more by Wallace Stevens. And um, I want to point out that in the first line, there's a reference to an elephant's ear. And it's not actually talking about the uh, ear of the large terrestrial mammal. An elephant's ear is a green-leafed plant, a particular species. This poem is called Tea by Wallace Stevens. When the elephant's ear in the park shriveled in the frost and the leaves on the paths ran like rats, your lamplight fell on shining pillows of sea shades and sky jades like umbrellas in Java. Ah. All right, one more. This is the last one I mean at this time. This poem is called Theory by Wallace Stevens. I am what is around me. Women understand this. One is not duchess a hundred yards from a carriage. These that are portraits, a black vestibule, a high bed sheltered by curtains. These are merely instances. All right. Thank you, Wallace Stevens. <clears throat> so, <laughs> thank you, Dari. Nice poem. Um, <clears throat> All right, this is part six of Peter Pan. Part six begins with chapter 10, entitled The Happy Home. One important result of the brush on the lagoon was that it made the Indians the Lost Boys' friends. Peter had saved Tiger Lily from a dreadful fate, and now there was nothing she and her braves would not do for him. All night they sat above, keeping watch over the home under the ground and awaiting the big attack by the pirates, which obviously could not be much longer delayed. Even by day, they hung about smoking... The pipe of peace, man. <laughs> they called Peter the Great White Father, prostrating themselves before him, and he liked this tremendously, so that it was not really good for him. The Great White Father, he would say to them in a very lordly manner as they groveled at his feet, is glad to see the Piccalilly warriors protecting his wigwam from the pirates. 
I am Tiger Lily, that lovely creature would reply. Peter Pan saved me. I am his friend. I will not let pirates hurt him. Peter would answer, it is good. Peter Pan has spoken. Oh, summary. Oh, dear. Back up. Rewind. I have totally skipped the summary. Oh. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> oh, glad you caught that. I knew there was more foreplay before I just jumped right into that. Okay. Right. So, um, let's do... Uh, pardon me. Beep, 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 indeed. Um, okay, so, yeah, let's get everybody caught up. Where are we? Summary part five of Peter Pan. As promised, we heard the tale of the lagoon, where the children spent long summer days swimming and playing mermaid games, but definitely not with the mermaids who loved Peter but couldn't tolerate his friends. One day they were playing at Marooner's Rock, and the lagoon changed from a laughing place to a formidable place. When Peter yelled, Pirates! Dive! There was a gleam of legs, and the lagoon seemed deserted. Smee and Starkey had Tiger Lily as a captive in their dinghy and were going to leave her on the rock to drown when the tide came up. Peter chose to imitate Hook's voice to say, Set her free. Of course, they followed Captain's orders, but the real Captain Hook came swimming up to the boat, and Peter couldn't resist taunting them with his Hook voice and claiming to be Hook. Eventually, a fight between the boys and the pirates ensued. As Peter and Hook were on the rock fighting, Peter saw that Hook had a disadvantage and helped him up. Hook repaid Peter by biting him, and the absolute unfairness of this just dazed and horrified Peter. Hook took off, swimming for the boat because the tick-tock of the croc was chasing him. The boys found the dinghy and called and called for Peter and Wendy, but decided they had flown back to their underground home. However, Wendy and Peter were stranded on Marooner's Rock with no energy to swim or fly home. Michael's kite came floating by, so Peter convinced Wendy to use it to fly home, but Peter was alone on the rock, which would soon be submerged. The Neverbird saw Peter's plight and made a desperate attempt to make Peter understand to use her nest as a boat. Peter got into her nest, but then used Starkey's hat, which floated beautifully, and put the Neverbird's eggs in it. She was delighted and sat snuggled on her eggs. Now, all Neverbirds built in that shape for their nest. And the boys got to go to bed late that night, which was perhaps the biggest adventure of all. I, yeah, I, I love that they, they're, they're fighting pirates with swords, but they have a bedtime. Okay, now that we've actually got the summary attended to, let us restart. Let us say hello to Charity Swanson. And then, Charity, you're just in time for the restart. Okay. Part six, Peter Pan, from the book by James M. Barry. This begins with chapter 10, entitled The Happy Home. One important result of the brush on the lagoon was that it made the Indians their friends. Peter had saved Tiger Lily from a dreadful fate 
and now there was nothing she and her braves would not do for him. All night they sat above, keeping watch over the home under the ground and awaiting the big attack by the pirates, which obviously could not be much longer delayed. Even by day they hung about, smoking the pipe of peace. They called Peter the Great White Father, prostrating themselves before him, and he liked this tremendously, so that it was not really good for him. The Great White Father, he would say to them in a very lordly manner as they groveled at his feet, is glad to see the Piccalilly warriors protecting his wigwam from the pirates. I'm Tiger Lily, that lovely creature would reply. Peter Pan saved me. I am his friend. I will not let pirates hurt him. Peter would answer, It is good. Peter Pan has spoken. Always when he said, Peter Pan has spoken, it meant that they must now shut up, and they accepted it humbly in that spirit, but they were by no means so respectful to the other boys whom they looked upon as just ordinary braves. We have now reached the evening that was to be known amongst them as the Night of Nights because of its adventures and of its and their upshot. The day, as if quietly gathering its forces, had been almost uneventful. And now the Indians in their blankets were at their posts above, while below the children were having their evening meal, all except Peter, who had gone out to get the time. The way you got the time on the island was to find the crocodile, and then stay near him till the clock struck. The meal happened to be a make-believe tea, and they sat around the board, guzzling in their greed, and really, with their chatter and recriminations, the noise, as Wendy said, was positively deafening. To be sure, she did not mind noise, but she simply would not have them grabbing things and then excusing themselves by saying that Toodles had pushed their elbow. There was a fixed rule that they must never hit back at meals. But should refer the matter of dispute to Wendy by raising the right arm politely and saying, I complain of so-and-so. But what usually happened was that they forgot to do this or did it too much. Silence, cried Wendy, for the twentieth time. She had told them that they were not all to speak at once. Is your mug empty, Slightly Darling? Uh, not quite empty, Mummy, Slightly said after looking into an imaginary mug. He hasn't even begun to drink his milk, Nibs interposed. This was telling, and Slightly seized his chance. I complain of Nibs, he cried promptly. John, however, had held up his hand first. Well, John? May I sit in Peter's chair, as he's not here? Sit in Father's chair, John? Wendy was scandalized. Certainly not. He's not really our father, John answered. He didn't even know how a father does till I showed him. This was grumbling. We complain of John, cried the twins. Toodles held up his hand. He was so much the humblest of him, of them. Indeed, he was the only humble one that Wendy was specially gentle with him. Um, I don't suppose, Toodles said diffidently, that I could be father? No, Toodles. Once Toodles began, which was not very often, he had a silly way of going on. As I can't be father, he said heavily, I don't suppose, Michael, you would let me be baby? No, I won't, Michael rapped out. He was already in his basket. Uh, as I can't be baby, Toodles said, giving, getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Do you think I could be a twin? 
No, indeed, replied the twins. It's awfully difficult to be a twin. As I can't be anything important, said Tootles. Would any of you like to see me do a trick? No, they all replied. Then, at last, he stopped. I hadn't really any hope, he said. The hateful telling broke out again. Slightly's coughing on the table. The twins began with cheesecake. Curly is taking both butter and honey. Nibs is speaking with his mouth full. I complain of the twins. I complain of Curly. I complain of Nibs. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Wendy. I'm sure I sometimes think that spinsters, spinsters are to be envied. She told them to clear away and sat down to her work basket. A heavy load of stockings and every knee with a hole in it, as usual. Wendy, remonstrated Michael, I'm too big for a cradle. I must have somebody in a cradle, she said almost tartly, and you are the littlest. A cradle is such a nice, homely thing to have about a house. While she sewed, they played around her, such a group of happy faces and dancing limbs lit up by that romantic fire. It had become a very familiar scene, this in the home under the ground, but we are looking on it for the last time. There was a step above, and Wendy, you may be sure, was the first to recognize it. Children, I hear your father's step. He likes you to meet him at the door. Above, the Indians were with Peter. Watch well, braves. I have spoken. And then, as so often before, the happy children dragged him from his tree, and, as so often before, but never again. He had brought nuts for the boys, as well as the correct time for Wendy. Peter, you just spoil them, you know, Wendy simpered. Ah, old lady, said Peter. It was me who told him that mothers are called old lady, Michael whispered to Curly. I complain of Michael, said Curly instantly. The first twin came to Peter. Father, we want to dance. <laughs> dance away, my little man, said Peter, who was in good humor. But we want you to dance. Peter was really the best dancer among them, but he pretended to be scandalized. Me! <laughs> My old bones would rattle. And mummy, too! What? cried Wendy. The mother of such an armful. Dance? But it's Saturday night! Slightly insinuated. It was not really Saturday night. At least, it may have been, but... They had so long lost count of the days, but always, if they wanted to do anything special, they said this was Saturday night. And then they did it. Of course, it is Saturday night, Peter, Wendy said, relenting. So, they were told they could dance, but they must put on their nighties first. Ah, old lady... Peter said, aside to Wendy, warming himself by the fire and looking down at her as she sat darning a sock. There's nothing more pleasant of an evening for you and me when the day's toil is over than to rest by the fire with the little ones nearby. It is sweet, Peter, isn't it? Wendy said, frightfully gratified. Peter, I think Curly has your nose. Michael takes after you. He looked at her uncomfortably, blinking. You know, like one not sure whether he was awake or asleep? Peter, what is it? I was just thinking, he said, a little scared. It is only make-believe, isn't it, that I'm their father? Oh, yes, said Windy, primly. You see, 
he continued apologetically, it would make me seem so old to be their real father. But they are ours, Peter, yours and mine. But not really, Wendy, he asked anxiously. Not if you don't wish it, she replied, and she distinctly heard his sigh of relief. Peter, she asked, trying to speak firmly. What are your exact feelings to me? Those of a devoted son, Wendy. I thought so she said, and went and sat by herself at the extreme end of the room. You are so strange, he said, frankly puzzled, and Tiger Lily is just the same. There's something she wants to be to me, but she says it's not my mother. No, indeed it is not, Wendy replied with frightful emphasis. Then, then what is it? It isn't for a lady to tell. Oh, very well, Peter said, a little nettled. Perhaps Tinkerbell will tell me. Oh, yes, Tinkerbell will tell you, Wendy retorted scornfully. She is an abandoned little creature. At this, Tink, who was in her bedroom, eavesdropping, squeaked out something impudent. Um, she says she glories in being abandoned, Peter interpreted. He had a sudden idea. Perhaps Tink wants to be my mother. You silly ass, cried Tinkerbell in a passion. She had said it so often that Wendy needed no translation. I almost agree with her, Wendy snapped. Fancy, Wendy snapping. But... She had been much tried, and she little knew what was to happen before the night was out. If she had known, she would not have snapped. None of them knew. Perhaps it was best not to know. Their ignorance gave them one more glad hour, as it was to be their last hour on the island. Let us rejoice that there were sixty glad minutes in it. They sang and danced in their nightgowns. Such a deliciously creepy song it was, in which they pretended to be frightened at their own shadows. Little writing that so soon shadows would close in upon them from whom they would shrink in real fear. So uproariously happy was the dance, and how they pushed each other on the bed and out of it. It was a pillow fight rather than a dance, and when it was finished, the pillows insisted on one bout more, like partners who know that they may never meet again. The stories they told before it was time for Wendy's good night story, oh, even slightly tried to tell a story that night, but the beginning was so fearfully dull that it appalled not only the others but himself and he said gloomily yeah it is a dull beginning eh? I say let us pretend that that is the end and then at last they all got into bed for Wendy's story the story they loved best the story Peter hated usually when she began to tell this story, he left the room or put his hands over his ears, and possibly, if he had done either of those things this time, they might all still be on the island. But tonight, he remained on his stool. And we shall see what happened. <laughs> okay. Quick compl <laughs> so, com a glance back through the chat seeing the sisters Christina. I complain of Dari. Well, I complain of Christina. And they both have their right hand raised. That's adorable. Uh hey Zach. Yeah. 
Yes, least lest we forget they are real sisters. Um. <clears throat> All right. Moving on. <clears throat> Chapter 9. Excuse me. Chapter 11. Wendy's Story. Listen then, said Wendy, settling down to her story with Michael at her feet and seven boys in the bed. There was once a gentleman. I'd rather it had been a lady, Curly said. I wish he had been a white rat, said Nibs. Quiet. Their mother admonished them. There was a lady also. Oh, mummy, cried the first twin. You mean that there is a lady also, don't you? She's not, she's not dead, is she? Oh, no. I'm awfully glad she isn't dead, said Toodles. Are you glad, John? Of course I am. Are you glad, Ni are you glad Nibs? Rather. Are you glad to... Are you glad, twins? We're glad. We're glad. Oh, dear. Sighed Wendy. A uh, little less noise there, Peter called out, determined that she should have fair play, however beastly a story it might be in his opinion. The gentleman's name, Wendy continued, was Mr. Darling. And her name was Mrs. Darling. I knew them, John said, to annoy the others. I think I knew them, said Michael, rather doubtfully. They were married, you know, explained Wendy. And what do you think they had? White rats, cried Nibs, inspired. No, it's awfully puzzling, said Tootles, who knew the story by heart. Quiet, Tootles. They had three descendants. Uh, what is descendants? Well, you are one twin. Ah, did you hear that, John? I am a descendant. Descendants are only children, said John. Oh, dear, oh, dear, sighed Wendy. Now, these three children had a faithful nurse called Nana. But Mr. Darling was angry with her and chained her up in the yard, and so all the children flew away. It's an awfully good story, said Nibs. They flew away, Wendy continued, to the Neverland, where the lost children are. I just thought they did, Curly broke in excitedly. I don't know how it is, but I just, I just thought they did. Oh, Wendy, cried Tootles. Was one of the lost children called Tootles? Yes, he was. I'm in a story! Hurrah! I'm in a story, Nibs! Hush. Hush. Now, I want you to consider the feelings of the unhappy parents with all their children flown away. Oh, they all moaned, though they were really not actually considering the feelings of unhappy parents. Not one jot. Think of the empty beds. Ooh. It's awfully sad, the first chin twin said cheerfully. I, I don't see how it can have a happy ending, said the second twin. Do you, Nibs? I'm frightfully anxious. If you knew how great is a mother's love, Wendy told them triumphantly, you would have no fear. She had now come to the part that Peter hated. I do like a mother's love, said Tootles, hitting Nibs with a pillow. Do you like a mother's love, Nibs? I do just, said Nibs, hitting back. You see, Wendy said complacently, our heroine knew that the mother would always leave the window open for her children to fly back by. So, they stayed away for years and had a lovely time. Did they ever go back? asked Toodles. Let us now, said Wendy, bracing herself up for her finest effort. 
take a peep into the future. And they all gave themselves the twists that makes peeps into the future easier. Years have rolled by. And who is this elegant lady of uncertain age alighting at London Station? Wendy, who is she? cried Nibs, every bit as excited as if he didn't know. It can it be? Yes, no, it is. The fair Wendy. Oh. And who are the noble, portly figures accompanying her, now grown to man's estate? Can they be John and Michael? They are. Oh! See, dear brothers, says Wendy, pointing upwards. There is the window, still standing open. Ah! Now we are rewarded for our sublime faith in a mother's love. So, up they flew to their mummy and daddy, and Penn cannot describe the happy scene over which we draw a veil. That was the story, and they were as pleased with it as the fair narrator herself. Everything just as it should be, you see. So great indeed was their faith in a mother's love. But there was one there who knew better. And when Wendy finished, he uttered a hollow groan. What is it, Peter? She cried, running to him, thinking he was ill. She worried over him. Uh, where is it, Peter? It isn't that kind of pain. Peter replied, darkly. Then what kind is it? Wendy, you were wrong about mothers. They all gathered round him in a fright. So alarming was his agitation, and with a fine candor, he told them what he had hitherto concealed. Long ago, he said, I thought, like you, that my mother would always keep the window open for me. So I stayed away from moons and moons and moons, and then flew back. But the window was barred, for mother had forgotten all about me, and there was another little boy sleeping in my bed. I'm not sure that this was true, but Peter thought it was true, and it scared them. Are you sure mothers are like that? Yes. Wendy, let us go home, cried John and Michael together. Yes, she said, clutching them. Not tonight, asked the lost boys, bewildered. They knew in what they called their hearts that one can get on quite well without a mother, and that it is only the mothers who think that you can't at once, Wendy replied resolutely, for the horrible thought had come to her. Perhaps mother is in half mourning by this time. This dread made her forgetful of what must be Peter's feelings, and she said to him rather sharply, Peter, will you make the necessary arrangements? If you wish it, he replied as coolly as if she had asked him to pass the nuts, not so much as a sorry to lose you between them. If she did not mind the parting, he was going to show her... And neither did he. But, of course, he cared very much. And he was so full of wrath against grown-ups who were spoiling everything that as soon as he got inside his tree, he breathed intentionally quick, short breaths at the rate of about five to a second. <laughs> he did this because there was a saying in the Neverland that every time you breathe a grown-up dies, and Peter was killing them off vindictively as fast as possible. Then, having given the necessary instructions to the Indians, he returned to the home where an unworthy scene had been enacted in his absence. 
Panic-stricken at the thought of losing Windy, the Lost Boys had advanced upon her threateningly. It'll be worse than before she came, they cried. We shan't let her go. Let's keep her prisoner. Aye, chain her up. In her extremity, an instinct told her to which of them to turn. Toodles, she cried. I appeal to you. Was it not strange? She appealed to Toodles, quite the silliest one. Grandly, however, did Toodles respond. For that one moment, he dropped his silliness and spoke with dignity. I am just Toodles, he said, and nobody minds me. But the first who does not behave to Windy like an English gentleman, I will blood him severely. He drew back his hanger, and for that instant his son was at noon. The others held back uneasily. Then Peter returned, and they saw at once that they would get no support from him. He would keep no girl in the Neverland against her will. Windy, he said, striding up and down, I have asked the Indians to guide you through the wood as... Flying tires you so. Thank you, Peter. Then, he continued in the short, sharp voice of one accustomed to be obeyed, Tinkerbell will take you across the sea. Wake her, Nibs. Nibs had to knock twice before he got an answer, although Tink had really been sitting up in bed listening for some time. Who are you? Who, how dare you? Go away! She cried. You are to get up, Tink, Nibs called, and take Windy on a journey. Of course, Tink had been delighted to hear that Windy was going, but she was jolly well determined not to be her courier, and she said so in still more offensive language. Then she pretended to be asleep again. She says she won't, Nibs exclaimed, aghast at such insubordination, whereupon Peter went sternly toward the young lady's chamber. Tink, he rapped out, if you don't get up and dress at once, I will open the curtains, and then we shall all see you in your negligee. This made her leap to the floor. Who said I wasn't getting up? She cried. In the meantime, the boys were gazing very forlornly at Wendy now equipped with John and Michael for the journey. By this time, they were dejected, not merely because they were about to lose her, but also because they felt that she was going off to something nice to which they had not been invited. Novelty was beckoning to them as usual, crediting them with a nobler feeling. Wendy melted Dear ones, she said, if you will all come with me, I feel almost sure I can get my father and mother to adopt you. The invitation was meant specially for Peter, but each of the boys was thinking exclusively of himself, and at once they jumped with joy. But won't they think of us rather a handful? Nibs asked in the middle of his jump. Oh, no, said Wendy, rapidly thinking it out. It will only mean having a few beds in the drawing room, and they can be hidden behind the screens on first Thursdays. Peter, can we go? They all cried imploringly. They took it for granted that if they went, he would go also. All right, Peter replied with a bitter smile, and immediately they rushed to get their things. And now, Peter, Wendy said, thinking she had put everything right, I'm going to give you your medicine before you go. She loved to give them medicine, and undoubtedly gave them too much. Of course, it was only water, but it was out of a bottle. And she always shook the bottle and counted the drops, which gave it a certain medicinal quality. 
On this occasion, however, she did not give Peter his draft, for just as she had prepared it, she saw a look on his face that made her heart sink. Get your things, Peter, she cried, shaking. No, he answered, pretending indifference. I'm not going with you, Wendy. Yes, Peter. No. To show that her departure would leave him unmoved, he skipped up and down the room, playing gaily on his heartless pipes. She had to run about after him, though it was rather undignified. To find your mother, she coaxed. Now, if Peter had ever quite had a mother, he no longer missed her. He could do very well without one. He had thought them out and remembered only their bad points. No, no, he told Wendy decisively. Perhaps she would say I was old. And I just want to always be a little boy and to have fun. But Peter, no. And so the others had to be told. Peter isn't coming. Peter not coming? They gazed blankly at him, their sticks over their backs, and on each stick was a bundle. Their first thought was that if Peter was not going, he had probably changed his mind about letting them go. But he was far too proud for that. If you find your mother's, he said darkly, I hope you will like them. The awful cynicism of this made an uncomfortable impression, and most of them began to look rather doubtful. After all, their faces said, were they not ridiculous to want to go? Now then, cried Peter, no fuss, no blubbering, goodbye, Wendy, and he held out his hand cheerily, quite as if they must really go now, for he had something important to do. She had to take his hand, and there was no indication that he would prefer a thimble. You will remember about changing your flannels, Peter, she said, lingering over him. She was always so particular about their flannels. Yes. And you will take your medicine. Yes. That seemed to be everything. And an awkward pause followed. Peter, however, was not the kind that breaks down before other people. Are you ready, Tinkerbell? He called out. Aye, aye. Then, lead the way. Tink darted up the nearest tree, but no one followed her, for it was at this moment that the pirates made their dreadful attack upon the Indians. Above where all had been so still, the air was rent with shrieks and the clash of steel. Below there was dead silence. Mouths opened and remained open. Wendy fell on her knees, but her arms were extended toward Peter. All arms were extended to him as if suddenly blown in his direction. They were beseeching him mutely not to desert them. As for Peter, he seized his sword, the same he thought he had slain Barbecue with, and the lust of battle was in his eye. End of part six. Hmm. Oh, well. I hope you all enjoyed that. I believe we have one part left in this. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, Dar. <laughs> That's where part six is ending this evening. 
Um, yeah, cliffhanger indeed. Cliffhanger indeed. Okay. Uh, I got a really interesting question that um, occurred to me as interesting um, in no small part because I, oh thank you uh, my mom is my mom who knows this like the back of her hand is saying no we have a few more parts um, okay thank you I trust and believe mom um, <clears throat> so uh, I got a really interesting question uh, I was asked in person and I, what struck me as, as fascinating about the question is that I don't think upon first glance most most people would actually understand what the question was. I was asked recently when one loses weight, i.e. burns fat, gets leaner, gets thinner, um, where does that weight go? How does that weight exit, as it were? Um, the person that was asking me was confused about the mechanism of how energy is stored in the body. The person who was asking me was thinking, well, like, E equals MC squared, right? So matter and energy, the body converts matter into energy. And uh, wait, 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 wait. E equals MC squared, etc. Yes, that is true, but your body does not have a nuclear fusion reactor inside of it. Uh, the way that the body stores energy, the way that the body takes in energy, is all chemical in nature. It's not nuclear in nature. So there's no converting of matter into energy that's going on in this exchange. When the body stores energy, it's chemically more similar to compressing a spring and then like locking that spring down in a way that later when you need that energy, you can release that spring. Um, so when you eat more calories than you burn, your body is extremely efficient at turning those excess calories into stored fat cells. And then later, as uh, let's say you do uh, whatever you do to get yourself into a caloric deficit, you do some cardio or you just eat less or however you successfully diet, when you actually do successfully diet and lose scale weight, we'll call it, lose body weight as measured by a bathroom scale, uh, the way that weight leaves your body surprises most people. It's actually from exhalation. So you exhale in terms of carbon dioxide and water vapor when you lose five pounds according to the bathroom scale um, you have not lost that five pounds let's say necessarily in the bathroom you have lost that five pounds very slowly very gradually eventually uh, by exhalation this is uh, you, this kind of intuitively makes sense when you think about that if you do a bunch of cardiovascular or aerobic activity and burn a lot of calories that way, that you get to breathing hard. And as you breathe hard, you exhale a lot. You exhale a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of water vapor. 
And the weight then that you lost from the scale is literally exhaled. So there's, I thought that was a really, really fascinating question because the, uh, again, the, the, the person who asked me the question was, was completely off base thinking that there was some kind of nuclear reaction of converting matter into energy going on in the human body. Like, yeah, no, we're, we're complex organisms, but we're not nuclear reactor complex. We're still carbon-based organic beings. And, yeah, we do all of our things on, um, in terms of chemical storage, chemical potential, chemical expenditure of energy. So, I think I will leave you all this evening with that interesting question. Um, if you have a, an interesting question, please drop it into this. <coughs> drop it into the email address over here. Um, AskHunterAnything at gmail.com. And uh, as always, if you feel so inclined and so generous... Uh, please drop a little something in the virtual tip jar over here on the right. Uh, tomorrow night on the Vaudacity Network is David Benjamin's Panano Man. Um, and uh, uh, before that, a friend of mine, uh, Ned Clark, um, is going to be doing a, uh, a live cast also from his Facebook page. I don't have a link for that yet because it's a Facebook live cast. So the link will not be um, available until it actually begins. But uh, if you want to join us for that, um, Ned Clark has been in a lot of chats for a lot of my shows and uh, he and uh, his wife, Benny, will be back in the chat this coming Thursday for the Lovecast. And, uh, uh, but yeah, join us for Ned's Livecast tomorrow. Um, Ned had a, uh, a, a severe life-threatening injury very early in the pandemic uh, in June of 2020. And uh, I believe Tuesday is the two-year anniversary of the accident and his survival. So um, tomorrow is, is a very pertinent anniversary uh, for Ned and which he's celebrating with music. And thank you for the reminder, Mom. Ned Clark was uh, the first guest... Uh, on the love cast that's right after uh after he had survived and and uh rehabbed for quite a while yes thank you christina um <clears throat> yes indeed so um that'll be at six o'clock tomorrow and then uh, of course join us uh later on the vaudacity network for the panano man tomorrow night uh, i think christina and i'll get a bottle of wine and grill and uh we'll be kicking back and listening to piano music uh, amanda on demanda of course uh wednesday amanda what time are you doing that now is it eight o'clock uh eight eight o'clock or eight thirty i forgot what uh what time it is and um then uh the love cast thursday uh, it'll be thursday at uh our new summertime starting also at 8 p.m. And um, all right, I'm going to cut it off there. Ah, Amanda is at 7.30. Okay. Amanda is at 7.30 on Wednesday night. Thank you. And uh, I love you all very much. Thank you for joining us. See you in the chat of multiple shows coming up, I hope. Good night.